All right, Rangers, here we are. We're going to do a quick review of India and China for your quiz, which is going to be Friday. For one, we're looking at the geography of India. On the Indian subcontinent, which is a mainland, a large body of land jutting out from the main area of the continent. In this case, it is India. The Indian subcontinent is made up more of just the modern country of India. You can see by the red here, on the Indian subcontinent, it contains three of the world's ten most populated countries, a very densely populated area, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. The things that protect India from the outside, very similar to Egypt, are the dense Himalayan mountains here to the north and the Hindu Kush mountains over here to the west. Two very big barriers that made it difficult for people to cross and get to them. To the south, we have the massive Indian Ocean. And so the size of India is very big. It's very diverse. It makes it difficult to unify the people. Most people live along the coastlines the eastern and western Ghats, or up by the well-watered rivers, the Indus and Ganges River Plain. When we think of India, we think of this big triangular part right here, and that's known as the Deccan Plateau. Most people don't live there. So here is the northern part of India. Again, I describe it as if you're standing in the Rocky Mountains, and you're looking eastward. Below you are the rich, fertile Great Plains. Today, again, most people live on the coasts, right next to the ocean, where all the rivers empty, and this harsh, desert-like land is the Deccan Plateau. Um, the two main rivers are the Indus and the Ganges. The Indus is in the modern-day um, river, or modern-day country of Pakistan. And this is the river when it's low. You can see it's very low. Land is sticking out. And when the monsoons come, it fills up. And here again, you see all the people living very close to the, the river. The first Indian River Valley civilization um, is connotated by the two twin cities of Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, two cities that were built about 120 miles apart and they were nearly identical. Harappa is a little bit bigger, but other than that, these cities were virtually the same. In India, it depends upon something a little different than the other civilizations we've studied. It depends upon a monsoon, which is a seasonal wind. So for several months of year, in the spring, Monsoon rains come, picking up off Africa, picking up moisture over the Indian Ocean. Then they dump weeks and, and, and just days and days of rains, um, and it's a deluge, much like eastern North Carolina is experiencing right now. And while this, this monsoon could be devastating with floods, it was also life-giving, as the people needed it to water their crops. Then in the fall, around this time of year, the winds change course coming out of Siberia, the Gobi Desert, and it's like turning a blow dryer on the land. It's a super heated vacuum. So a monsoon is a seasonal wind. It doesn't mean just rain. Over here, the Indus River Valley civilization will get started. It's the third of the river valleys, Mesopotamia first, and then Egypt. And then India, around 2500 to 1500 BC, they get started a little later because it took them a long time to actually get over here. And they settle in what is today modern day Pakistan. The cities of Harappa and Mohenjo Daro were very intricate. They were laid out in a grid plan. So it shows us that they understood mathematics. They have an intricate sewage system taking the wastewater out away from the city and, and filtering it. And they used a common system of weights and measures. Everything wanted to be uniform. What does that tell us about an ancient civilization? It tells us that 
there had to be some sense of strong central authoritative government. Someone to say, this is what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Since the cities are nearly identical, they had to be really good at organization and planning. You're not building one structure like a pyramid, you're building two. The labor materials, the actual workers to build the city, the plans, the construction, everything has got to be there. You don't have any downtime, and their geometric pattern tells us that they had a great understanding of mathematics. Now, one of the things that makes them unusual is in 1500 BC, the people just disappeared. We to this day don't know what happened to them. The cities are there, there are shovels and rakes and cook, cooking implements just waiting for the people to come back, but we don't know what happened because we can't read their writing system. Excuse me. All right, there's some of their, their coinage. The Indus River Valley is the one civilization that was settled not once, but twice. As a different group of invaders, Indo-Europeans come out of southern Russia, across Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and then they get into India. And they were nomads looking for places to have their herds, you know, their cattle, their sheep, their goats, graze. And these Aryan tribes, as they come all the way across the, the Middle East, were led by a Raja, or a tribal war leader. Again, think of Jasmine's tiger in the Disney classic Aladdin. Raja was the tiger who was going to defend Jasmine. Well, that's who the Rajas are. But over time, we don't need Rajas anymore because as they settle in the Ganges River Basin, they become farmers. And Aryans measured their worth in cattle. The more cattle you had, the more wealthy, the richer you were. All right, so we said over here that Diana was going to be a 40 cow girl. She would be super rich. All right, so if you were a dairy farmer, you were, you were um, living large. By 500 BC, right about the time that, that Greece is you know, getting ready to fight the Persian Wars, India is made up of many different rival kingdoms. Its size, its diversity, makes it hard to unite because the subcontinent was just so big. But the Aryan invaders and the native Dravidians begin to form and mesh together into a new civilization. And the Aryans will bring with them some ideas. These important religious ideas are known as the Vedas. Now, for many years, they were spoken orally. They were not written down, and after about a thousand or so years, they were. And they were written down into four Vedas or religious books of hymns, prayers, and other religious teachings. The most important one is the Rig Veda. It tells us about the society, about what was going on. And so here is where modern Indian society is going to form. The Vedas will describe a social hierarchy known as the caste system. Before it becomes a religion, it justifies your social position, where you are. On top, the most important people were Brahmins. All right? And underneath the title Brahmin are hundreds of different sub-jobs or groups, but they are the highest social class. After them, we get a Kshatriya, or like a warrior or a political noble. Underneath them, we get the Vyas. And the Vyas are pretty much everybody else. Merchants, herders, um, farmers, peasants, craftsmen. Are, this is about 90% of society. And underneath that, we have the Shudras, or the laborers. Almost the lowest of the low. Underneath them, we get the people known as untouchables. They did the really nasty, dirty work that nobody else wanted to, like being um, a trash collector, a butcher, handling the dead bodies. These are the people who are ostracized from society. And this period is known as the Vedic Age. It's about 1,000 years from 1500 to 500 BC. And India 
then becomes a battleground of different factions or rajas in this great diversity. Eventually, a dynasty is going to start the Mayura dynasty right around the same time that ancient Greece is in its heyday or very close to it. And it's settled by a guy named Chandragupta Mayura, who is the guy who unifies India and builds his famous capital city of Pataliputra. And he was the guy I told you that was guarded by the, the 400 female bodyguards because they were loyal. Chandragupta is very simple to like Hammurabi or the Qin dynasty, where he has a very harsh system of ruling, but it was efficient. He was trying to bring order to chaos. The most famous um, leader is a guy named Ahsoka, who became emperor in 268 after a massive battle where 100,000 people were slaughtered, and he will convert to Buddhism, which will travel via the Silk Road um, up in, 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 into China. And he promised good, righteous government, and he builds the four, the pillar of four lines, saying when you stand inside one of those pillars, Osha, Ahsoka promised good, just government. Um, and this, the Gupta dynasty, will last. Um, it's kind of synonymous with ancient Rome. Um, and it's at this time where Indian scholars create the concept of the zero and the decimal system. And they were extremely medically advanced, which we'll get back into in another unit. So that is a brief outline of ancient India. Now we're going to go and complete ancient China. China is the last of the four river valleys because traveling from East Africa, even getting into India, it's so much farther to get to China. And in China, we will settle in the Huang Ho or the Yellow River Basin, right here in the corner of China. And it gets its name from Loess, this golden fine soil that blows out of Siberia and the Gobi Desert. And when it hits the water, it turns it this fine gold color. So here's Mesopotamia and Egypt over here, the first two river valleys, then India, and then China. And the Chinese called themselves the Middle Kingdom because they literally felt for many years that they were the sole center of the universe. To them, there just didn't seem to be anybody else out there. And so they are protected by several geographic barriers. Once again, the Himalayan mountains to the south, um, just above uh, India. Um, then there are the dense, thick jungles of Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. The Gobi Desert to the north, the Tin Shan Mountains to the southwest, and to the east, the giant Pacific Ocean. So it gave the Chinese the idea that they were the only ones around. Um, the river is also known as the River of Sorrows, where the Chinese history begins because you have these high cliffs and the people kept going down to the river and it was hard to go down the mountain and up the mountain so they began to settle in places like this but the soil did not make good mud they couldn't hold like sticks and rocks together to make dams and dikes so when the monsoon rains would come the rivers would flood and it was called the river of sorrows until around 1650, there is a, the legend of you. You was a village official who will grab a shovel and dig ditches. He will dig drainage canals in and around his village for 13 years to protect it from flooding. And the Chinese gods reach down and they give him the blessing of leadership. He will become the first emperor of China and start the Shang Dynasty. And the thing about such the Shang apart, instead of building one big palace, the Shang traveled to the many that their nobles um, had built. They thought it was important for their people to see them. In ancient China, the rich people, the warriors, formed um, the military. Um, normally it's the poor people because there's a lot of them, but ancient China, 
the guys who could afford weapons and armor were all wealthy. So it was the nobles who formed the backbone of the Chinese army. And most people were peasants. They spent all of their day working in the field. And of all the river valleys, the, the, the greatest disparity between rich and poor was in ancient China. Um, the religion, like everybody else's, was polytheistic. Um, the Chinese had an emperor who was chosen by the gods. Unlike China, he was not a divine right leader. And people believed that the gods would, um, were there, but the Chinese add a little different. Besides the polytheistic gods of nature, they believed in ancestor worship, where if you would pray to a deceased ancestor, they were closer to the Lord of heaven, and they could help bring good fortune to the family, like keep the family safe, have the crops grow. You couldn't be greedy. And I explain it, it's how like Roman Catholics will use a saint. Well, you can't pray for yourself 24 hours a day, but a saint can. It is a difference between the polytheistic religions of China and everyone else. Chinese also believed in a balance of yin and yang. Everything must be kept in balance. Heaven and earth, light and dark, male and female. So the famous yin-yang symbol, you have female, who is represented by darkness because fertility. From, the, from Mother Earth, the food grows. But inside female is a little white dot. Male is heaven, light, and male. But inside it is a little bit of darkness. Because each gender has a little bit of the traits of the other one in it, so to speak. You have to understand where you're coming from in this very delicate balance. Heaven, earth, male, female, light, dark, must be kept in synchronicity for everything to work well. The Chinese had a very intricate writing system. The people spoke different languages or dialects, you know, where the language may be the same, but it sounds different. Like I gave the example up in Boston, they may ask and move your car. Hey, your car's in the way. They're talking about a car. We're out in California. Sure, hey, loose, bro, let's go, man. Yeah, what's up? Or you look at, you know, down here in the South, it's, hey, what are y'all doing? All right? In New York City, it's you guys. In the Midwest, it's, hey, what are you guys doing? In Pittsburgh, it's, what are yins doing? It's just a different way of pronouncing things. And the dialects sometimes didn't match up or were hard to understand. So everybody will eventually write the same thing. But it was difficult to learn as you had to learn how to write 10,000 different characters. And you had to be neat because changing the angle of a line could turn a positive into a negative or a compliment into an insult. So you had to be very careful. But eventually the Shang Dynasty is going to collapse in 1027. And the problem with that is how do you overthrow a dynasty, a ruling family that is blessed by the gods. Shang was blessed. How can we overthrow someone divinely ordained? And the answer to that is, well, if the gods no longer like them, they will remove their blessing. And the Chinese will call this the mandate of heaven. The gods believe they knew when it was your time to rule, and when you screwed it up, you lost it. Here is the Chinese dynastic cycle. I gave you my cutout, where at the beginning of the cycle, the emperor works hard, he rolls up his sleeves, he repair, repairs irrigation canals, gets rid of invaders, redistributes land to peasants, and appoints good officials. And his few next few descendants do that, but after a while, the dynasty begins to age because the emperor, his great-great-great-grandpa did all the hard work. Now all I have to do is maintain it. Several years after that, the emperor becomes a spoiled brat. He's not paying attention. The irrigation canals break. The um, defensive walls decay. Bandits are invading. He ignores corruption in his government officials, and he charges heavy taxes to pay for his luxury items. At that time, the gods will remove the mandate, 
China will experience a period of flood, famine, invasion, bad things, and eventually the cycle will start again with someone of the people, like a peasant or a general, coming to power and then moving forward, starting the whole process over again. And it runs 31 times throughout Chinese history. China's most valuable export becomes silk because it maintained its bright color, it would insulate you, it kept you safe, it brings China a lot of money, and its secret was punishable by death. The Chinese began to write on pieces of bamboo, so they made the world's first hardback books. Um, um, here is some of the writing again, you can see some of the pictograms, each um, Drawing represented a thought, a word, or um, an action, and so you had to be really neat and precise. Eventually, the Zhao dynasty is going to collapse, and the third dynasty is the Qin dynasty, C-H-I-N or Q-I-N, and they believed in a thing known as legalism, which we're talking about in this unit, where everything is about law, structure, and organization. Harsh penalties were, were derived for breaking the law. They felt that people were greedy. So if what you do wrong is severely punished, you hopefully won't do anything wrong. Confucius was one of the guys whose teachings survived. Um, Shi Wangdi, the legalist emperor, burned all the books that he didn't agree with, that, that countered his um, philosophy, except for Confucius and a few others. Some of the good things that Shi Wang Di is, he connected the different sections of the Great Wall into one long massive wall, now about 5,000 miles long. Um, he also built several thousand warriors to protect him in the afterlife, the famous terracotta soldiers. And these soldiers were living examples, living representations of his bodyguard. They weren't cookie cutters. Each one looked like one of you individual students in the, in the classroom, and he ordered everybody to write with the same writing system. That's a quick review. That is coming up on Friday. If you have any questions, please ask. All right. See you guys soon.